of Judgment, the Watergate hearings, is made possible in part by a grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. This is a police photograph of James W. McCord. He is one of five persons surprised and arrested yesterday inside the headquarters of the Democratic National Committee in Washington. McCord is... I was appalled at this senseless, illegal action. And I was shocked... <laughs> District Court Judge John Sirica today set bail at $100,000 each for two former Nixon re-election campaigns. Judge Sirica has Los Angeles Times quotes Watergate defendant James McCord as saying that Dean and former presidential aide Jeb Stuart Magruder knew in advance of the plan. Decisions of my presidency, I accepted the resignations of two of my closest associates in the White House, Bob Haldeman, John Ehrlichman, two of the finest public servants. There can be no whitewash at the White House. The committee will come to order. I began by telling the president that there was a cancer growing on the presidency. What did the president know and when did he know it? The Senate caucus room. It's a square old room, a little pompous but practical, just across from the Capitol on Constitution Avenue. Hello, I'm Charles McDowell. In this room, Senate committees have investigated assorted embarrassments in our political history, from Teapot Dome to Joe McCarthy. And here, 10 summers ago, the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities held hearings on the darkest passage in American politics, Watergate. It started in 1972 as a break-in at a campaign headquarters, police court stuff. But the burglars turned out to have White House connections. The effort to cover up those connections became a conspiracy in the White House to obstruct justice and to place the president above the law. When the truth came out, President Richard Nixon resigned. To get at the truth of Watergate, the Senate committee brought to this room a remarkable parade of burglars and fixers and men of standing, including the president's principal assistants and a former attorney general. The committee that examined them was a fascinating collection itself, headed by an old senator who seemed somehow to have sprung out of Southern folklore to guide us through a constitutional crisis with country wit. Beyond the personalities and the whodunit aspects of the story, Watergate was about big themes, the constitutional separation of powers, the protection of individual rights, the function of a free press. The people of the United States were caught up in all this to a degree that might seem unlikely to anyone who didn't experience it. Day after day, week after week, we watched the drama played out in one disclosure after another. It was all on television. And through television, the people became a part of the process of judgment in the summer of 1973. So let's go back to early 1973. President Nixon was settling into his second term. He'd won the 72 election by a landslide in spite of a potentially troublesome incident during the campaign, the arrest of burglars on a political spying mission inside Democratic National Headquarters at the Watergate office building. The Nixon managers denied any part in such goings on and most of the news media lost interest after a while. But some gritty investigative reporters and a stubborn judge, John Sirica, kept pursuing evidence of White House involvement in the break-in. Watergate wouldn't go away. So the Senate, prodded by the Democratic majority leader, Mike Mansfield, set up a special investigating committee. Looking around for a chairman who wouldn't seem too partisan or self-seeking, Mansfield was drawn to a 76-year-old senator from North Carolina. Sam Irvin was the man for the job. He was a Democrat but conservative, a former judge. His fellow senators knew him as a nonpartisan authority on the Constitution and the Bible, and as wily an old country boy as ever came out of North Carolina. Chairman is fond of pointing out from time to time that he is just a country lawyer. He omits to say that he graduated from Harvard Law School with honors. <laughs> If 
for Senator from Tennessee will yield, I'd like to say a word in my own defense on that point. <laughs> I had a friend introduce me to North Carolina audience. He'd say he understood I was graduate of Harvard Law School, but thank God nobody would ever suspect it. <laughs> I went to Morganton, North Carolina, to visit Senator Irvin, now 86 years old and retired, for some recollections of that historic summer of Watergate. Senator Irvin, why you? How did you come to be chosen as chairman of the Watergate Committee? Mike Mansfield, I think, is one of the finest human beings I've ever known. And he wanted the investigation to be fair, and not only wanted to be fair, but he wanted it to appear to be fair. So the first thing he did was rule out for membership among the Democrats, any Democrat that was suspected of being a, wanting to be president or vice president. That includes most of the Democrats in the Senate. <laughs> right. And uh, so having done that, he told me he wanted to be chairman for three reasons. The first was that I had had more judicial experience than anybody in the Senate. The second was I was the most nonpartisan Democrat he had in the Senate. And the third was that nobody could just accuse me of ever having harbored vice presidential or, or presidential ambitions. What did you expect to discover at the beginning? Did you think it would reach the president? I didn't imagine, however, the president was involved. You did not. I thought we would find that uh, some of his overzealous aides had overstepped the bounds of political decency. Did it dawn on you slowly or of a moment that the president was involved? Well, if I became suspicious um, that the president wasn't a, 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 a toting fair with, you use the North Carolina term, with the country in uh, the matter, because as soon as the committee was set up, before it had had an organizational meeting or had a hired a single uh, aide, President Nixon issued a public statement in which he said under the doctrine of executive privilege, he would not permit any of his aides or former aides to testify before the committee. But I have noticed a long time that a person is in, uh, being investigated or tried and they have any information, their power that would exonerate them, they can't run fast enough to carry it to the fact finder. The other fact finders on the Watergate Committee intentionally were chosen from among senators who were not especially well known or outwardly ambitious for higher office. For the Democrats, besides Irvin, Herman Talmadge of Georgia, Joseph Montoya of New Mexico, and Daniel Inouye of Hawaii. I tried my best to convince my colleagues that we were not prosecutors. Somehow we gave the impression to the people in the United States that we were out to determine the guilt or innocence of persons involved. That was not our job. Three Republicans sat on the committee with the four Democrats. Up and coming Howard Baker, who'd been a tiger as a trial lawyer in Tennessee, became vice chairman. The other Republicans were Edward Gurney of Florida, who emerged as President Nixon's chief defender on the committee, and Lowell Weicker of Connecticut, a maverick whose sense of moral outrage came out in very tough questions. Uh, I think a lot of people feel because of the tough questions that I pose that uh, I started out, you know, being, quote, against Richard Nixon or a Nixon hater. Uh, not so at all. Uh, that took a lot of learning over a lot of months before I got to the point where I felt that uh, uh, there were some problems as far as the president and the presidency were concerned. Sam Dash, the Georgetown University law professor who became the committee's chief counsel, reflects on what the committee knew as it began its investigation in March and April of 1973. Um, there was some newspaper reporting suggesting uh, perhaps White House involvement, but it was all suggestion. There was no evidence, no indication that could establish any relationship. Our investigation began there. Fred Thompson, a political friend of Howard Baker's from Tennessee, was the minority counsel. This young Republican came to Washington thinking the hearings would last only about a month and assuming there wouldn't be much evidence of wrongdoing among the higher-ups at the White House. Well, when I started, I, I hoped and believed that uh, the hearings would clear, clear up any questions about who was involved and, and who was not involved, and I certainly believe that uh, at that time, there's no reason to believe the president or any of the people who had responsible positions under the president were involved. Dash and Thompson recruited a staff of investigators. They worked around the clock in crowded offices in the Senate basement, 
sorting out a tangle of leads and interviewing prospective witnesses. Gradually, they began to piece together a complex and bizarre story of diverted campaign funds, wiretaps, and still more burglaries. Early on, a dispute developed over the order of witnesses to be put on the stand in the caucus room. And there was some sentiment for calling the big names first and getting it out and, 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 uh, and really kind of going to the horse's mouth, the Haldemans, the Ehrlichmans, and the Mitchells, and, and really find out what was there, if anything, and getting it over with. I think there was a... Uh, a lot of sentiment that this was something that for the sake of the nation and everyone else should not be dragged on uh, uh, forever. So there was some thought to doing that. Senator Baker, I think, initially favored that approach. Uh, some others on the Democratic side, Sam Dash, I think primarily wanted to go uh, kind of bottom from the bottom to the top and bring in the, uh, uh, the lesser lights, the witnesses, and piece a case together as much as you would in a trial. And after discussion, that was the, that was the way in which uh, the committee decided to proceed. May 17, 1973. After the two frantic months of preparation, the hearings began. The three commercial networks and public television were there with live coverage. These would become the most extensively televised congressional hearings before or since. Scott Armstrong, a committee investigator, remembers the shock when he walked into the room. That first day when we walked into the hearing room and suddenly saw all those cameras, uh, it just, it was a circus that we hadn't expected. Uh, I think all of us uh, somewhat recoiled from the notion that uh, the kind of public scrutiny that was going to be given us and the, the, the committee and the way in which it looked into the White House, uh, it made us very self-conscious and wondering if we were fully prepared. At 10.02 a.m., Senator Irvin brought down the gavel. The aim of the committee is to provide full and open public testimony in order that the nation can proceed towards the healing of the wounds that now afflict the body politic. The nation and history itself are watching us. We cannot fail our mission. We will inquire into every fact and follow every lead, unrestrained by any fear of where that lead might ultimately take us. The atmosphere that first day was like the first day of school. Part ceremony, part uncertainty, nothing really heavy on the schedule. Reflecting Dash's build from the bottom plan, the first witness was not a showstopper, but one Robert Odell. Counselor, will call the first witness. Uh, will Mr. Robert Odell uh, please come to the uh, witness uh, table? He was the former office manager of the Committee to Re-elect the President, known as CREEP. I would like to use this opportunity to make just one brief point. I joined the staff of the Committee for the Re-election of the President more than two years ago because I believed in President Nixon and in his hopes and dreams for America. The public's fascination with Watergate mounted by the day as the intense coverage by the news media soaked in. There were complaints from people who missed their soap operas. After the first week, the networks began taking turns covering the sessions live. The infant public television service covered live in the daytime from Washington and then rebroadcast the hearings in prime time every night into the wee hours. Aggressive investigative reporting in newspapers and magazines, particularly the work of Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein for the Washington Post, had laid the basis for the Senate investigation. As for the relatively new medium of television, its importance to these hearings, to the process of public judgment, cannot be overestimated. I wanted every American citizen to be able to hear and see the witnesses for themselves and make their own judgments, not have the judgment of somebody else. And the only way to do that, if they couldn't come to the caucus room and see and hear the witness themselves, is to watch it. And the only thing we have today, and God bless it, we have it, is through television. And it was that, and not because we wanted publicity for the committee, but in order to be able to bring all of America into a democratic process, which is the working of their Congress. And it worked, I think. It did work. The public's curiosity and concern were reflected early every morning in the lines that formed on Constitution Avenue to get into the hearings. Watergate also was the talk of Main Street. From May to August in that summer of 1973, Millions of Americans sat in their living rooms and watched this remarkable story played out in the caucus room by real people, some of whom became as familiar as the neighbors. 
In the course of the hearings, over a million and a half letters poured into the committee. Most, but not all, were favorable. Terry Lenzner, one of Sam Dash's principal assistants. Uh, we were flooded with uh, mail, thousands of letters every, every week. We received over 100 to 200 telegrams a day. I received tel uh, telephone calls at my home throughout the night and at the office during the day. Uh, many people in this country perceived this to be a national call-in show where they could, in fact, uh, offer questions that they wanted asked uh, to these very uh, important uh, uh, figures in government and have them, in fact, asked and get their, their questions uh, put on every day. And I thought that was an extremely healthy uh, kind of participation by the uh, citizens of this country in uh, what they perceived to be a quiz show, but a one of, of a very high nature and a very important nature. Democracy had never worked quite this way before. Never had a nation participated so intimately in an investigation of its government. The early witnesses here in the caucus room could have been characters out of a crime story in the tabloids. The cop on the beat, the wire man who tapped telephones, the bag man who delivered hush money. Gradually, the witnesses constructed the story. Members of the committee to re-elect the president planned the burglary. The object was information to embarrass the Democrats. Members of the White House staff were involved in authorizing hush money for the burglars. And it was all coming out because the break-in was botched at Democratic headquarters in the Watergate on the night of June 17, 1972. The committee quizzed a policeman whose beat was the Watergate. So that the time, what you're saying, is the time from when you believe Baldwin to have seen you to the time that you apprehended uh, the defendants was a period of five minutes? At the most, yes, sir. Next, the committee heard from one of the burglars, James McCord. He demonstrated how to bug a telephone. Cover would be taken off of the telephone, and two of the wires connected with this would be interconnected in series with the wiring within the phone itself. McCord was known as a good wire man, but the good wire man was not proud of his part in Watergate. My participation in the Watergate operation on my part, for whatever reasons I may have had at the time, whatever rationale I may have had at the time, was an error, was a mistake, and a very grave mistake, which I regret. He thought that he was a patriot that he thought he was doing things for his country. Uh, perhaps he had to know better. But he did have a higher perception of his goals, and that he did at least think that he was doing something for his president, and doing something for the White House, even though it was something he should have known better uh, about doing. And that when he realized that the White House and the president were not going to back him up, and they were not going to stand behind him and admit that, yes, we authorized this, and this was a White House operation, and that he was going to go down in history as simply a burglar, a common criminal. McCord, James McCord, couldn't stomach that. Uh, is it a fact now, Mr. McCord, that you presently stand convicted on a multi-count federal indictment charging burglary, electronic surveillance, and conspiracy arising out of the break-in of the Democratic National Committee headquarters at the Watergate? That's correct. And are you now awaiting sentence on that conviction? That is correct. A few months before the start of the hearings, McCord had written a letter to Judge John Sirica, who presided over his trial in federal court. McCord revealed political pressure from the White House to remain silent. The judge made the letter public. It was the first crack in the cover-up. When the wall of silence cracks, that crack begins to widen, 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 and the wall crumbles. And then any good investigator wants that first crack. And we got it. McCord was it. Political pressure from the White House was conveyed to me in January 1973 by John Caulfield to remain silent, take executive clemency by going off to prison quietly. And I was told that while there, I would receive financial aid and later rehabilitation and a job he saw that one of the strategy, strategies of the White House was to blame it all on the CIA, too. And he, he was a great uh, loyalist to the CIA. And therefore, he decided that uh, he was going to revolt against that. 
angered, speaking of my own feelings, and at the time the letter was written, angered because of what appeared to me to be a ruthless attempt by the White House to put the blame for the Watergate operation on CIA where it did not belong. I sought to head it off by sending a letter to Caulfield. Dear Jack, I am sorry to have to write you this letter. If Helms goes and the Watergate operation is laid at CIA's feet where it does not belong, every tree in the forest will fall. It will be a scorched desert. James McCord's presentation had been somber. Anthony Ulazowitz, a former New York City policeman, brought a touch of Damon Runyon humor to the caucus room. Cheerfully, he told the committee of his role as the hustling messenger between the burglars and the White House. Besides messages, he delivered hush money to some of the burglars from Herbert Kalmbach, Richard Nixon's personal attorney and unofficial fundraiser. I take it you were having uh, these conversations phone booth to phone booth between yourself and Mr. Kalmbach? That is correct. And uh, were you loaded down with change, uh, Mr. Lassowitz? Oh, yes, indeed. And how did you carry that change? Well, when I started out, I started with kind of a little box deal. And when I uh, finished up, I had a, uh, a bus guy, uh, one of these things that you click <laughs> with quarters and dimes and nickels. Did you report that back to Mr. Kalmbach? I Kombach? reported that back to Mr. Kalmbach and had to wait his call back again. All of these were again precluded. I call him, wait for comeback, and, and I began to call him comeback, comeback calls. <laughs> I think he was quite a character on television. But the issue was what he was doing. I suppose that uh, I, like many others, uh, uh, can't fault in any way uh, what is a wonderful sense of humor, Mr. Ulasowicz. But I must confess that a long time ago, I lost my sense of humor on the activities uh, that you've described here today. Uh, I tell my friends, as a matter of fact, that uh, it seems that today's Watergate joke becomes tomorrow's testimony. And uh, I would only ask you this question to try and appropriately frame the description which you gave to me. You know where Mr. Liddy is right now? Yes, sir. Where? He's in prison. Mr. Hunt? He's in prison. Mrs. Hunt? She's dead. Mr. Barker? In prison, I believe. Mr. Gonzalez? In prison? I'm not certain of that. Mr. Sturgis? The same. Mr. Martinez? Same. I think what we see here is not a joke, but a very great tragedy. I have no further questions. If indeed Ulasewicz is funny, then I can assure you politics is going to get dirtier and dirtier in this country. That's the reason why I blew the whistle on him. Senator Waker Weicker's reaction to, to my questioning of uh, Tony Lasowitz was, um, uh, was very negative. By the same token, um, I felt personally that uh, uh, the day after day of, uh, of uh, tension and drama, um, it would not hurt to have some balancing uh, uh, humorous incidents. Jeb Stuart Magruder had been the deputy director of the committee to re-elect the president. This ambitious young executive coolly explained how the break-in and a whole scheme of political espionage had been masterminded by the re-election committee. And he charged that John Mitchell, the former attorney general of the United States, had personally authorized the Watergate break-in when he was running the Nixon campaign. G. Gordon Liddy, the counsel for the re-election committee, was the author of the plan. Did there come a time when you had a third and
What was that project specifically, as you recall? It was specifically uh, uh, approval for initial entry into the Democratic National Committee headquarters uh, in Washington, and that at a further date, if the funds were available, we would consider uh, an entry uh, into the presidential contenders headquarters and also uh, potential at the uh, Fountain Blue Hotel in uh, Miami. Did it also include use of electronic surveillance? It included bugging? electronic surveillance and photography of document, uh, pho photographing of documents. At one point, Senator Baker asked him to explain why the committee to re-elect the president had authorized a burglary. If you were concerned because the action was daunting you to be a lady, because you thought it improper or unethical, that you thought the prospects for success were very big, and you doubted the reliability of Mr. Liddy, what on earth would it have taken to decide against that man? Not very much, sir. Response here. I am going to put the law as an example. And, uh, and of course, in ethics, as an example, you can be a strong cop. But I respect Barry, and I think he was quoted the other day and saying, well, I guess these things are available in the course of ethics. And I think he's probably correct. He tells me my ethics. Right. I fully accept the responsibility of having made an absolute disastrous decision, or at least participated. I didn't make the decision, but certainly participated in it. Uh, a, deci a decision, really, that is going to affect history that was made in all, almost a casual way. Yes, sir. Jeb Magruder gave the appearance of a man who was sorry for what he'd done, and he helped the committee. Not so Magruder's superior, John Mitchell. The former attorney general didn't remember much. What he did remember was not heavily laden with regret. Mitchell, in the phrase of the day, was stonewalling. He had tried to protect the president from knowledge of Watergate in the beginning, and now he would loyally try to protect him from the consequences of it. John Mitchell's allegiance to Richard Nixon went back several years, to the time Nixon joined Mitchell's New York law firm. The law partners also became close personal friends. In 1969, the new president made Mitchell his attorney general. For three years, Mitchell advanced his president's promises of law and order in America. But Mitchell was in on some unlawful conniving. It was in his office at the Justice Department that G. Gordon Liddy proposed a scheme of wiretaps and break-ins against the Democrats in the 1972 campaign. Mrs. Mitchell, the outspoken Martha, raised eyebrows in the Washington establishment. Her late-night phone calls to reporters made headlines. Mitchell never got along with the inner circle around the president at the White House, but he remained fiercely loyal to Richard Nixon. He agreed to head the re-election campaign and resigned as attorney general. Two weeks after the Watergate break-in, he left the campaign and went back to New York. After the Senate hearings, he was indicted for trying to block a government investigation of financier Robert Vesco in exchange for a contribution to the Nixon campaign. He was acquitted on that charge. Mitchell later served 19 months in prison for his part in the Watergate cover-up. Now disbarred, Nixon's old law partner works in Washington as a business consultant. My reaction was uh, representative of most of my colleagues, that here was a valiant soldier standing up for his general. The Irvin Committee wanted to know if Mitchell had indeed authorized the Watergate break-in, as Jeb Magruder said he did. Mitchell denied it. The senators tried to get some idea of what the president had known about Watergate. 
Mitchell didn't make it easy for them. When do you think the president found out about Watergate and the cover-up? I haven't any idea, Senator. I haven't any idea at all. Why hadn't Mitchell taken it upon himself to tell the president that his re-election committee was behind the break-in? Not only had he kept quiet about that, he hadn't told the president about earlier proposals for illegal activities. Mitchell himself called those plans the White House horrors. He had not told the president about any of it, Mitchell said, in order to protect him. Now, you state that uh, you uh, kept silent concerning the things you knew because you considered the, uh, the uh, re-election of President Nixon uh, of such extreme importance. That is correct, sir. I wonder if uh, your statement ought not to be changed a little bit. You say that you didn't want President Nixon to find out about the White House horrors. Isn't, fa fact that is, isn't it the fact that you didn't want the American people to find out about it? Well, I think that's one and the same because, as I testified before, that if the president had found out about it, obviously he would have pursued his responsibilities in that area very vigorously. And um, you were afraid to tell the president, rather you, uh, I won't say afraid, but you uh, preferred not to tell the president and didn't tell the president because you didn't want the president to do what you call lowering the boom. That's exactly correct. And if he had low lowered the boom, why, the thing would have been exposed. I don't think there's any doubt about it. And the American people would have learned about it. They would have learned about and it. And it might have affected the votes of the American people. It's quite conceivable. Yes. I don't expect to the extent where, that uh, some of us might believe. I think that's a matter for debate, but it certainly could very well have affected the you election. You know, I, I have a high opinion of the American people in that. Uh, I think that the president had lowered the boom. If you'd told the president, the president lowered the boom, and had come out performing his constitutional duty to see that the laws uh, be faithfully, take care of the laws be faithfully executed, I think he would have made his election more sure than ever. Some of the senators were incredulous that Mitchell could even have listened to Gordon Liddy's astonishing proposal for a sordid law-breaking in the campaign. After all, he was Attorney General of the United States. If there is one man that is, uh, has got to stand above uh, all else in this nation in the sense of enforcing our laws, it's the Attorney General of the United States. I know that Mr. Mitchell figures why well, he toughed it out on behalf of his boss, but I don't think there's anything to boast about there. I think he should have toughed it out on behalf of the people of the United States. Uh, I must confess, Mr. Mitchell, that as I have sat here and listened to your testimony, the only difficulty I find with it is that it is sometimes difficult to realize that we have sitting before the committee not some administrative assistant to some deputy campaign director, but we have a campaign director sitting before this committee. Some deputy assistant attorney general sitting before the committee. We have the attorney general of the United States sitting before the committee. Senator Weicker kept pressing Mitchell. Why hadn't he been appalled by the Liddy schemes? Why hadn't he reacted in a way that would put an end to this kind of thing that eventually led to the plan for a burglary at the Watergate? Now, on the 27th of January, 1972, Gordon Liddy uh, presented uh, a plan in your office, in the office of the Attorney General of the United States. And uh, that uh, plan, complete with visual aids, uh, included uh, elaborate charts of uh, uh, electronic surveillance and breaking and entering and prostitution and kidnapping and murder. Uh, you've indicated that uh, uh, in hindsight, That is exactly what happened, Senator. 
And as I say, in hindsight, it was a grievous error. Senator Baker tried to understand Mitchell's concept of the presidency. Is the president... Election. All of those things were inferior in importance to the ultimate re-election of the president? I have no doubt about it at that time, and I have no doubt about it now. Isn't it unfair that he's now undergoing the hostility and the suspicion of a nation in this respect, with the allegations of cover-up, with the lingering suspicion about what he knew? Well, isn't that, that greatly, uh, isn't that far more that, that's unfair? A, that's a statement that I'm not prepared to accept, Senator. I do not believe the nation feels that way, and I don't believe that anybody has come to the point where come to the point where they have one shred of evidence that he was knowledgeable of the break-in. You know, I, I think you and I are talking about two different things. I'm talking about suspicion. Obviously, because we generally get along fine. Well, we still do get along fine, and I'm delighted that I have this opportunity to probe into a great mentality of a great man. Well, Senator Baker found himself in a very unique uh, role. He never made any bones about the fact that he wished that his friends, Richard Nixon and John Mitchell and, uh, and some of the others, you know, John Mitchell picked up the phone one day and asked Howard Baker if he'd like to be on the Supreme Court of the United States. I mean, you, 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 don't, uh, uh, you, you, you don't proceed as if those things never happen. What you do is acknowledge them and then do what you got to do. After two and a half days of testimony, the committee excused John Mitchell but not before the normally controlled Sam Dash made an indignant observation. Now, Mr. Mitchell, do you draw the strength, distinction, and you've made it from time to time that it was your purpose not to volunteer anything, a distinction between not volunteering and lying? Well, it depends entirely on the subject matter. Mr. When you Dash. ask the direct question and you don't volunteer the direct answer, you might say you're not volunteering, but actually uh, you're lying on those Well, I think we'd you. have to find out what the specifics are of what particular occasion and what case. Well, I'll go back to the February, the July uh, 5 question of the FBI as to whether or not you had in, any information on the DNC break-in and your answer, uh, only what you read in the newspapers. I found that John Mitchell tried to evade us uh, and to avoid answering questions. Uh, he, he got the uh, award for stonewalling. Surely the most memorable witness of the summer was John Dean, the former counsel to the president. Unlike so many of the president's men, Dean came here to tell all he knew. His testimony became the standard against which all future witnesses would be tested. Until Dean, the hearings were about burglars and fixers. After Dean, the hearings were about the president and the obstruction of justice. John Dean was a young man in a hurry. Soon after he came to Washington, he was serving the most powerful men in government. At the age of 30, he landed a job high in the Justice Department, working directly with John Mitchell, then the Attorney General. They became good friends. After two years, he went to the White House as counsel to the President. But he wasn't able to get close to Richard Nixon. The White House inner circle, men like Bob Haldeman and John Ehrlichman, blocked his access. Then came the Watergate break-in. Soon, Dean was coordinating the cover-up. That made him important to the president, and he was in and out of the Oval Office. When the cover-up began to fall apart, Dean suspected his superiors were setting him up as a scapegoat. He went to the prosecutors with his story. Soon afterward, Dean was fired. It happened the same day that Haldeman, Ehrlichman, and Richard Kleindienst resigned. Two months later, John Dean emerged as the star of the Senate hearings. He also was the key government witness in the trial of the major Watergate defendants. His cooperation got him a relatively light prison term of four months for obstruction of justice. He now lives in California with his wife, Maureen. Disbarred, he works as a freelance writer and radio producer. Mr. John W. Dean III. John Dean was the most devastating witness I ever heard, and I've 
as a lawyer and a judge and a, a legislator, I've spent many years of my life listening to witnesses. From the beginning, it was obvious that John Dean could be an important witness. As counsel to the president, he knew the internal workings of the White House and he was willing to talk. But he wanted immunity and he didn't want to tell what he knew to the staff and committee in advance, as other witnesses were asked to do. He was worried that the, um, that our Republican members of the committee, as well as the Republican staff of our, uh, of our uh, committee, uh, would report back uh, to the White House his cooperation. And therefore, if, if he had to appear before our staff or our committee, uh, there'd be no cooperation. Uh, I figured out a way to work with John Dean and avoid that danger. Um, I suggested to him that we have what I called non-meetings. Uh, that I would go outside the Senate office building, meet with him at any place he suggested. He suggested his home. Sam Dash began going to John Dean's house late at night to meet with Dean and his lawyer, Charles Schaeffer. There, the real story of Watergate began to come out. Clearly, Dean was indispensable, and Dash had to convince the committee and staff to bring him to the witness table on his own terms. Of course, I raised hell about that, and uh, uh, it was a question of whether or not Dean was going to have to abide by the rules that we had or whether or not he had become irresistible. And I lost. He had become irresistible. Dean's prepared statement, 245 pages long, laid out what he knew about others' involvement in the Watergate affair and his own role as the coordinator of the cover-up. In a sometimes shaky monotone, he told a tale that could devastate the Nixon administration. It's a very difficult thing for me to testify about other people. It's far more easy for me to explain my own involvement in this matter, the fact that I was involved in obstruction of justice, the fact that I assisted another in perjured testimony, the fact that I made personal use of funds that were in my custody. It's far easier to talk about these things myself than to talk about what others did. Some of these people I'll be referring to are friends, some are men I greatly admire and respect, and particularly with reference to the President of the United States, I'd like to say this. It is my honest belief that while the President was involved, that he did not realize or appreciate at any time the implications of his involvement. And I think that when the facts come out, I hope the President is forgiven. When Dean talked about what the president knew about Watergate, he was drawing on direct knowledge. He recalled a conversation in the Oval Office a few months after the break-in, when he realized the president was aware of the cover-up. The president told me I had done a good job, and he appreciated how difficult a task it had been, and the president was pleased that the case had stopped with Liddy. I responded that I could not take credit because others had done much more difficult things than I had done. As the president discussed the, the present status of the situation, I told him that all I've been able to do was to contain the case and assist in keeping it out of the White House. I also told him that there was a long way to go before this matter would end, and that certainly, I certainly could make no assurances that the day would not come when this matter would not start to unravel. Dean told of another meeting with the president a few months later, when the cover-up was increasingly difficult to manage. The convicted Watergate burglars were demanding money. I told the president about the fact that there was no money to pay these individuals to meet their demands. He asked me how much it would cost. I told him I could only make an estimate that it might be as high as a million dollars or more. He told me that that was no problem. He also looked over at Haldeman and repeated the same statement. Dean said he was exasperated by the president's unwillingness to see how serious the situation was. It was my particular concern with the fact that the president did not seem to understand the implications of what was going on. For example, when I had earlier told him that I thought I was involved in an obstruction of justice situation, he had argued with me to the contrary after I'd explained it to him. Also, when the matter of money demands had come up, previously he had very nonchalantly told me that that was no problem. I did not know if he realized that he himself could be getting involved in an obstruction of justice by having by having promised clemency to, to hunt. 
What I had hoped to do in this conversation was to have the president tell me we had to end the matter now. Accordingly, I gave considerable thought to how I would present this situation to the president and try to make as dramatic a presentation as I could to tell him how serious I thought the situation was that the cover-up continue. I began by telling the president that there was a cancer growing on the presidency and if the cancer was not removed, the president himself would be killed by it. I also told him that it was important that this cancer be removed immediately because it was growing more deadly every day. Dean felt he had warned the president. He was worried about his own culpability, too. He was afraid he was being made a scapegoat for Watergate, so John Dean went to the prosecutors. I told the president that I had gone to the prosecutors and that I did not believe that this was an act of disloyalty, but rather in the end would be an act of loyalty. I told him I felt this matter had to end. I informed the president that I had told the prosecutors of my own involvement and the involvement of others. The president almost from the outset began asking me a number of leading questions, which was somewhat unlike his normal conversational relationships I'd had with him which made me think that the conversation was being taped and a record was being made to protect himself. Although I became aware of this because of the nature of the conversation, I decided I did not know it for a fact and that I had to believe that the president would not tape a, such a conversation. Toward the end of the conversation, the president recalled the fact that at one point we had discussed the difficulty of, in raising money, and that he said that $1 million was nothing to raise to pay to maintain the silence for the defendants. He said that he, uh, he had, of course, only been joking when he made that comment. As the conversation went on, and it's impossible for me to recall anything other than the high points of it, I became more convinced that the president was seeking to elicit testimony from me and put in perspective, put his perspective on the record and get me to agree to it. The most interesting thing that happened during the conversation was very near the end, he got up out of his chair, went behind the chair to the corner of the executive office building, off, office, and in a n nearly audible tone said to me, he was probably foolish to have discussed Hunt's clemency with Colson. I do not recall that I responded. Dean's disclosures had amazed the committee and the country but many had trouble believing what they'd heard. Uh, when John Dean first uh, appeared on the scene, uh, I did not believe the most substantial part of his testimony. Uh, my experience is, is nobody, uh, nobody lies completely, and uh, uh, some people tell the truth completely, but, but, but nobody tells all falsehoods, so I give him credit for that. He's very smart, obviously. But uh, I thought that he was twisting things to his favor. I doubt if any one of us at the outset believed him. It was too fantastic. For four days, the committee questioned John Dean, taking him back through crucial passages in detail. Senator Baker asked the question that would be heard many times during that summer. But the central question at this point is simply put, what did the president know and when did he know it? There was an effort by some of the Republicans to discredit Dean. They seized on information about Dean's own finances. He admitted he'd taken money from a White House safe for personal use, part of it to pay for his honeymoon. Dean maintained he'd planned to return the money. I recall in your testimony, why didn't you replace it uh, shortly after this time? Well, at one point I did put in back in what I had uh, into the account and uh, uh, but in November, when I was trying again to, to get a honeymoon in, I took it back out again. How much? Uh, Senator, I have no idea. Uh, the question was, if he didn't use the money for that, what did he use the money for? Did he put it in his pocket? Uh, little things that you would ask uh, any witness on cross-examination to question their credibility. I don't believe that it did anything more to show, uh, than show that John Dean was an ambitious, opportunist-type young man who might have engaged in some peccadilloes of that kind. At one point, Dean disclosed that the White House kept lists of its enemies. He admitted he'd participated in this effort to harass an assortment of people seen as unfriendly to the administration. Mr. Dean, I would like to now refer to a memo 
dated August 16, 1971, <clears throat> and you have testified that this was prepared for Mr. Haldeman, Mr. Ehrlichman, and others at the White House. It is dated August 16, 1971. It's classified confidential. Subject, dealing with our political enemies. I'd like to read part of this, sir. This memorandum addresses the matter of how we can maximize the fact of our incumbency in dealing with persons known to be active in their opposition to our administration. Stated a bit more bluntly, how we can use the available federal machinery to screw our political enemies. In your testimony, you have submitted uh, several exhibits with lists of names, politicals, members of Congress, members of the media, members of the entertainment field, etc., etc. And taking this memo together with that list, I might add also, Senator, before we go forward, I don't believe that list is complete in and of itself. It just happens to be uh, a part that I received and had uh, access to uh, before my files were shut down. There may well be additional names and additional uh, information available on that. Mr. Dean, I believe one list would have been enough. It turned out that Senator Weicker himself had been a White House target. In an emotional speech, he called for a higher standard of morality in the executive branch. There are going to be no more threats, no intimidation, no innuendo, no working through the press to go ahead and destroy the credibility of individuals. If the executive branch of government wants to meet the standards that the American people set for it in their minds, then the time has come to stop reacting and stop playing this type of a game. I say before you, and I say before the American people in this committee, that I'm here as a Republican. And quite frankly, I think that I express the feelings of the 42 other Republican senators that I work with, and the Republicans of the state of Connecticut, and in fact, the Republican Party, far better than these illegal, unconstitutional, and gross acts which have been committed over the past several months by various individuals. Let me make it clear, because I've got to have bipartisan moment. Republicans do not cover up. Republicans do not go ahead and threaten. Republicans do not go ahead and commit illegal acts. And God knows Republicans don't view their fellow Americans as enemies to be harassed, but rather I can assure you that this Republican and those that I serve with look upon every American as human beings to be loved and one. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Dean's testimony produced a number of shocks. The enemies list was one of them, but it was Dean's story in its entirety the implications of the whole pattern of operations in the White House that ultimately was so devastating. I think John Dean's testimony turned the hearings around uh, completely. I think we, we were leading up to uh, a, um, a, a, a raison d'etre, a, a meaning uh, for the, uh, what Watergate was all about. Uh, it, uh, as I've indicated, uh, transformed the meaning of Watergate from a political burglary to uh, a message to the public that uh, something dangerous had happened in the United States. John Dean's testimony changed the course of the hearings and of history. But at the time, when it was all so hard for some people to believe, Dean was David challenging Goliath. Nobody had yet stepped forward to back him up. Dean stood alone, and he knew it. I'm quite aware of the fact that in some circumstances, it's going to be my word against one man's word, it's going to be my word against two men. It's going to be my word against three men. And probably in some cases, it's going to be my word against four men. But I'm prepared to stand on my word uh, and the truth and the knowledge and the facts I have. And uh, uh, I know the truth is my ally in this. And I think ultimately the truth is going to come out. But how would the truth come out? Who would possibly confirm Dean's story? Surely not the president, 
not his closest aides who could be expected to testify that Dean was lying. How would we ever know? After a brief station break, I just have a hunch we'll discover the White House tapes. Summer of Judgment, the Watergate hearings, is made possible in part by a grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. This is PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service. This is PBS.